Let's take a look at Sybil objects. I'm going to open R. And the first thing we're going to do in every session is to load the package FPP3. And when that loads, you'll see that uh, some information comes up telling you that other packages have been attached. Um, some packages from the tidyverse, like Tibble and dplyr and tidyr and lubridate and ggplot2, and some other packages that are to do with handling civil objects, graphics, and modeling and forecasting for time series. So they're the Tibble, Tibble Data, Feasts, Fable, and Fable Tools packages. So this is just telling you, you don't need to load them separately. They've already been loaded when you load FPP3. Then the next part of the screen tells you that there's some functions which have the same name in different packages and it's telling you which one it's going to use if you use one of these functions. So for example, if you use the filter function, it's, it's going to use the one from the dplyr package, not the one from the stats package and so on. Okay. Now, the, uh, the FPP3 book is based around the use of civil objects. So let's talk about civil objects. So here's an example of one. This is in the package. It's the global economy uh, data set. And if you just type the name of the object, then it'll give you on the screen some information about it. So the first thing it tells you is there's 15,150 rows in this object and there's six columns. And the data is one year apart. So that tells you about the frequency of observations. Um, so it'll tell you whether it's a year apart or a month apart or three months apart or whatever. And then the sec next thing it says is there's a key variable called country and there's 263 countries in this data set. That is, there's actually 263 separate time series. Okay, let's look at the, the variables. The first one is year, which is has a special role in a tibble. It's an index variable. It's the one that indexes the time series. Then the next variable is a key variable. So it's the one that determines um, the different unique time series in the data set. And then everything else we call measured variables. They are individual variables that we might wish to model. Um, the Y variables, if you like. Okay, so that's an example of a Tibble with one key and 263 um, different time series. It was actually 263 um, country year, sorry, country combinations. Um, and for each country, there's four variables. Okay, here's another example. This is Australian tourism data. And here we have 24,320 rows and five columns. And it's quarterly data because they're one quarter apart. And there are three keys in this data set, region, state, and purpose, giving us 304 unique combinations of region, state, and purpose, 304 time series. The first column is, again, the index. It determines the timing of each observation. This time we have three keys, region, state, and purpose. And there's 304 combinations of those and only one measured variable, which is the number of trips. Um, and so this data set is the domestic visitor nights in thousands by state, region, and purpose in Australia. Okay, so a tibble will contain an index, it will contain possible keys and some measured variables. Um, it's designed to allow storage and manipulation of lots of time series simultaneously. The index is mandatory. It has You have to have an index to be a tibble. Um, then there are potentially measured variables. It's not a very interesting tibble if there are no measured variables. So you normally see them. And optionally, some key variables. And they uniquely identify each series. The nice thing about tibble objects is that they work well with tidyverse functions. They're based on a tibble, so you can use them with other tidyverse functions, and I'll show you some examples of that. Okay, how do they, how do you make these? Most of the time, we're going to use them straight out of the package, and they will be there, ready for you to use. Uh, so, for example, if I'm in if I'm in R, and I just type 
and I just type global economy. There's my civil ready to go. By loading the FPP3 package, I now have access to that data set and many other data sets. But if I want to create my own, um, I need to uh, to use some 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 extra functions. So here's an example of a very very simple Sybil being created in R. So you use the function Sybil, and you give it whatever variables you've got. So I've got a year variable and I've got a y variable, and then you have to specify which one of them is the index. Every Sybil needs an index. So in this case, the year is the index. So I save that, and um, and that's it. I save it as my data. And if I type my data, I will get the output um, that you were seeing before. In this case, it's recognized that it's annual data, one year apart. So it's just looked at the index and figured out that looks like it's annual data. Doesn't always get it right, and, and we sometimes need to help it. I'll show you an example. OK, so that's how you create a Sybil. Often, though, you don't start from scratch like that. Often you've read in some data from a CSV file or an Excel file. Somehow you have it already stored as a data frame or a tibble, and you want to convert that into a tibble. So more frequently, you'll do something like this. You'll have a tibble object sitting there. So here I've created a tibble object, exactly the same code as before, just without the index. And then I just go, I pipe that into as underscore tibble and say index is equal to the year. And that gives me the same results as I had before. Um, you should be familiar with the pipe operator. Um, there's two pipes actually commonly used in R. There's this one, the percent greater than percent one, and there's this one, the vertical bar greater than. Um, for our purposes, they will effectively be doing the same thing. They are slightly different in some cases, but for the way we're going to use it, either is OK. And in the slides, I'm using the uh, the native one, the vertical bar greater than sign. Um, OK, so here's an example where you might uh, need to help, um, help uh, learn what the index is all about. So here I have a tibble. I've read it in from somewhere. And I have a column which is months, and I have a column which is my observations. Now notice the months are stored as character. CHR means it's a character. So this is being stored as a string. And it doesn't understand what that means. So I have to tell it what it means. And I can use the year month function like this to say, interpret this as a year followed by a month. And so it reads it as a year month. And you can see now it's changed from character to MTH to a month variable, and it now understands, um, and, and I've, I've piped it into as Tibble, and I've said the index is the month, so you now see it knows that it's monthly data, one month apart. Some of the other common um, helper functions that you need to create time indexes are year quarter, year week. Um, if it's daily data, you might use as date or YMD or some other variation if you have the um, if you have the date format differently you can have dmy or mdy or or any of those sort of things and sub daily data you normally have it as a time as a date time variable because you need a date as well as a time for sub daily data there's a few more um, but they're the ones you'll come across most frequently okay now let's do a couple of examples. I want to do a first example where I read in data from a CSV file, do some manipulation to turn it into a Tibble. It's a very common thing to do. Um, so let's do it on some Australian prison population data uh, that was part of a consulting project um, that, that my co-author George did. Uh, so that's a picture of a prison in Beechworth, Victoria. I grew up in Beechworth, Victoria. I walked past that every day on my way to school. Um, and the data here is uh, stored in this CSV file. So I've used the read CSV function to read it into a, um, an object called prism. If I just do that, I get back a tibble. 3,072 rows, six columns, and here are my six columns. And you can see that it's automatically figured out 
or tried to figure out what the columns contain. So it thinks the first one is a date, um, and then I've got three, four characters, and then I have a double, which is a numerical storage um, class. Okay, so that's not bad, um, but it's actually not daily data. This is quarterly data, um, and it's the way it's been stored in the CSV file is the first day of each quarter. So I'm going to have to turn that into, into a quarterly variable. So let's do that. I'll, start, I'll use the mutate function to create a new variable called quarter, and I use the year quarter function to say interpret this date as a quarter. And so that's what it's done in creating the new quarter variable. Still a tibble. I haven't yet turned it into a tibble object. I no longer need the date variable because I've got the quarter variable. So I get rid of the date variable by selecting minus date. And then lastly, I can turn it into a tibble by saying which variable is the index, which is the quarter, and which variables are keys, state, gender, legal, and indigenous status. So the keys give me 64 different series in this data set. Um, the only measured variable is the count, the count variable there. Um, and that's it. So that's how you create it. If, if, you, if I left out key, it would complain because it would say there's not, un, um, you don't have unique rows here. So the key is important to specify unique combinations. Um, and in general, a row of a tibble must have a unique combination of the time index and the keys. You can't have repeats or duplicates. Okay. Let's do another example, this one using the Australian Pharmaceutical Benefit Scheme data. I talked about this earlier, it was a data set from a consulting project that I did for the Australian government. Um, so the PBS, you remember, is the Australian Government Drug Subsidy Scheme, where people go to the pharmacy and purchase drugs and the government subsidizes it. Um, and so the need to know the cost of those drugs for each different type of drug and how many scripts are being purchased so that we can forecast how much money the government needs for the next year of operation. The costs are disaggregated by drug type. There's 15 different anatomical therapeutic classification groups called ATC1s. And there's another classification, um, more a more fine-grained classification called level two ATC, and there's 84 groups of those drugs. And then there's two different types of concession categories. And there's two different types of patients in the way they record the data. So we end up with 84 times 2 times 2, or 336 time series. Um, the 84 level 2 classifications are nested within the 15 ATC1 classifications. So that's why you don't multiply 15 times 84. Okay, so if you just type PBS into R, you'll see um, something like this, which is all of the data already prepared for you. And we have um, 67,596 rows, there's nine columns. Four of the columns are key variables, concession, type, ATC1 and ATC2. There's a couple of columns which are just more information about the groups, which are these two. That's the description for the category, ATC1 category. So you see there's an A, which means ATC1 group A. And what does that mean? It means this, which has been truncated. So the tilde means it's truncated. There was more information there. Um, ATC2 group A01. Um, and this is the description um, of that group. And then the two measured variables are scripts, how many scripts were sold, in that month for that group, or for that combination, and total cost in Australian dollars. Okay, well, I want to do things with this data set. I don't want to analyze it like that. I want to um, group some of the things together. So I'll show you how to do that. First of all, I'm going to pull out only A10 drugs. That is only drugs with ATC2 group 10. So I can use the filter the filter function to say, only give me the rows of that symbol, which where ATC2 is exactly equal to A10. So I get back this one. Notice now I've only got four series left. 
um, because there's um, two types of concessions and two types of patients. So two by two gives me four series. And there's only 816 rows that I've got here. Then I'm going to um, get rid of the stuff I no longer need. Um, so I'm going to get and, and only keep month, concession, type, and cost. Um, and everything else is, is omitted. And then I want to summarize across the different concession groups and patient types. So I just use the summarize function and I say, we'll summarize and we'll store that as total cost, total C. Um, notice that I don't have to group by the month as you would normally would have to do if you were doing this for a Sybil uh, because it's sort of inherently grouped by month, part of the structure of a Sybil object. And then those are quite big numbers and that's gonna make my graphs messy. So I'm going to uh, turn it into millions of dollars. So I will now um, create a new variable called cost and it'll be the original dollars divided by a million. One E6 means a million. And now I wanna save that. I could have started the whole thing with a left assignment operator, but I can actually finish it with a right assignment operator. Now you might not see this very often, but it's quite useful in a whole string of piped commands. You wanna save the thing at the end, you use the right assignment, so a hyphen and a greater than, and store that in this object A10. So it's exactly the same as if I'd started the whole set of, com of commands with A10 uh, and, a, and a left assignment. If I'd started like that, it would be the same as if I end like this. Okay, so uh, that's that's how we handled civil objects. You can use all the dplyr functions, filter, select, summarize, mutate, and so on. Um, and you just have to make sure you have an index column and that your keys uniquely define each time series.